You may have noticed, maybe around autumn time last year, that the French rugby team looked good again. And I may add that that specific team that took England to extra time was not even the second team. More like the third team, to be honest. It was like watching Bugsy Malone take on the Godfather with all those young French kids in the team going head to head against big English boys. In fact, they were looking good in last year's Six Nations, making England look foolish in the opening game, beating them 24-17, only to be beaten by the Scots 28-17 in their natural environment. You know, the wet and windy gales. <sighs> Which then allowed England to grind out a Six Nations overall victory against Italy. But other than the slight hiccup in Scotland, France were the real champions of the Six Nations. Much like how England were the real World Cup winners in 2019, beating New Zealand. I'm not biased. I'm really not. So how did this happen? France seems to have come out of nowhere from a team that used to be ill-disciplined or a bit punchy, and who would drop the ball and make silly, simple mistakes. To a team that seems to all be on the same page, from the forwards to the backs, attacking well with a good mix of driving from the fronts to well thought out kicks, chases and runs from the backs. Well if anyone paid attention to the under 20 world championship final between England and France in 2018, where they completely smashed and outplayed England 25 to 33 away from home, you would see what is pretty much a mirror image of the adult squad that we see today in the French team. Most of the players in the form of Entomac, Dupont, Woki, and Bamba, and many others, were all in that team, and are now in the adult national team playing extremely well. Dupont is by far the best scrum half in the world right now, if you ignore, you know, Faffy, Faff, Faff de Klerk. Uh, the youth players that have come through are truly incredible for France, though. But why has this happened now? Well, I have a theory. Many British newspapers and commentators have warned that French rugby could have died in the past years due to the huge difference in salaries they pay for their domestic league from other leagues all around the world, meaning that talent would flock there from outside the country and therefore close the door on homegrown talent. If you look at 2009 to 2011, the salary cap set by Ligue Nationale de Rugby, the organisation responsible for the French National League, was 8 million euros, while the English league cap was only 4 million pounds. That is about half. So of course, this theory could be correct. You had people like Johnny Wilkinson being paid a six-figure salary while still being under the salary cap for his team too long, which meant that the level playing field leagues of England and the other home nations, as well as even the mighty New Zealand, who had just a two million uh, pound or whatever currency they use, I don't really know, cap, uh, around that time, um, and could, you know, grow their home talent and surpass the likes of France in being the best in the world. This theory definitely makes sense when you look at New Zealand in particular. These guys are the best in the world, and yet they are not paid anywhere near the French. And you can take this analysis even further by looking into the differences in school rugby and grassroots to judge why only Southern Hemisphere teams seem to be winning the World Cup, other than the one that England won, of course. Uh, and the answer is simple, really. The grassroots in school rugby in New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, and even Argentina, to some extent, is played in all schools and has genuine interest, having high turnout of the parents to watch, and some of their matches are even televised in many of these countries, much like how the NBA and the NFL and any of the American sports really create their sports superstars. The difference in the Northern Hemisphere is that rugby is traditionally a public school boys game, and it still is today in some regards. In the 2015 England World Cup squad, 21 of the 31 players went to a fee-paying school while 21 of the 35 in the 2019 World Cup squad went to these schools. The number is the same, but the squad is bigger, so the ratio has gotten a little worse. You know, that's just statistics. But anyway, back to France. France is different in its traditions of rugby. They have been like the Southern Hemisphere, and have always had the sport played by all, mostly in the south of France, much like New Zealand, by families of farmers. 
A certain Barrett family comes to mind when you think of a, a farmer family rugby player. So why do we not have a French version of New Zealand with a family of Barretts, with maybe an accent on the E? Barrett. Well, this is down to the salary cap, meaning that French nationals are being ignored in favour of fancy f players like, you know, Finn Russell and, and the like. Who, yes, yeah, they're the best in the world at what they do and are being paid for it. To be more empirical, if you look at the change of when the sport became professional and French flair or flair was replaced by an import of talent from overseas, the stats, they, they, don't, they don't lie. In the 20 years running up to 1999, when the sport became professional, France won or drew 9 out of 20 of the Six Nations tournaments. That's nearly 50%. That's pretty darn good. Whereas in the 20 years from 1999 to now, they have only won 5 out of 20. That's not as good, is it? So this theory of salary caps does seem to hold a bit of weight. However, things now appear to be changing for the French. Although the salaries are still staying increasingly high, I mean in 2009 it was 8 million, as I already said, and it has actually increased to 10 million for 2015 and is still at around about that amount, maybe a little bit more. However, slowly they have been creating incentives in France for homegrown talent, which were not there before. The big change came in 2015 when youth players were excluded from the cap unless it was over 50,000 euros, and in 2018 each club that contained a French national team member on its roster were allowed to exceed the cap by a set amount per member. This amount was set at 100,000 euros for 2015 and increased to a whopping 200,000 in 2016. That's just a year difference. This has meant but not only does the large amount of money incentivize the young farmers, players who want to earn money that will change their lives and take up rugby as a sport, much like the overseas players who see their money and want to have a bit of it, but it also means that the coaches running the clubs are more likely to have more members of their teams who are French nationals, so that then they have this access to this bigger you know, more money to play with to purchase star players from overseas in their budgets, like Finn Russell or Ibn Edspeth or Mao Nonu. Oh my god, I'm sorry for the pronunciation. But anyway, this, this has meant that they now have more youth French players than they ever had before, really, and they get to play with, learn to play with, and play against on a regular basis these star players that, that they're bringing in into their domestic tournaments. This means that France is now a force to be reckoned with. They realised they had a problem with less nationals in their home sport and they've combated it with more incentives rather than flattening out and equaling out the pay gap, uh, cap. This means that French kids growing up will see these great salaries and will aspire to gain them and will be the next Michael Jordan superstar, you know, but a rugby. And now they will actually have the chance to do it, whereas before the door was ajar, now it's been opened a little bit for them. I am interested to see how the next 20 years will turn out for the sport. If France keeps this up, they could become the new New Zealand and will be able to pick from a huge amount of homegrown talent. France have managed to create an incentive of money for its youth to take up rugby. The Southern Hemisphere offers prestige and cheering crowds in their school games. And this is where the UK kind of falls behind. If England in particular wish to ever be a dynasty as good as New Zealand, then incentivizing the youth game must come first. But this doesn't mean that we don't have youth coming through. But we do still have this problem of public versus private schools. Rugby must be played in all schools and opportunities should be there for those who have the talent. An example of where this has worked in England in recent years is the Exeter Chiefs, 
almost all of the star players in this team who have played for England are homegrown and they have come from majority free schools. Only Henry Slade and Harry Williams are from fee-paying schools, whereas Luke Count Dickey, Jack Knoll, Johnny Hill, Alec Hepburn, Ollie Devoto and the Simmons brothers are all also English but are from free schools and have worn the England shirt. Well, not Joe Simmons of course, yet, because Owen Farrell's in the way and we all know how Eddie loves him. But anyway, that's a majority ratio of 6 out of 8 being from free schools. That's completely different from the national side statistic for England. And yet the Chiefs are champions of both England and Europe. Maybe it's because they've opened up the doors to the less posh people. Who knows? In short, incentives to the youth game are the way forward to become a rugby giant like New Zealand, or any sporting giant for that matter. And at the moment, the youth of France are showing their stuff, and I like it. Why is all this important? Who knows? But I do know that France has a very good shot at winning the Six Nations, and then maybe even winning the World Cup at home.